Okay, let, let's start. Hi everyone, I hope uh, you're all well with the lockdown. Uh, I'm very happy to have Professor Ingmar Kalfas uh, from University of Stuttgart today. Uh, I think it's the third time that uh, Ingmar is uh, delivering a, a course or a talk uh, in the ACRC. This time it is short and with the limited uh, facility with uh, the COVID-19, it's only a webinar, but we hope that the fourth time will be again on campus for a longer time. So Ingmar, the floor is, my, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back uh, at Technion, at least uh, virtually. Uh, I do hope that we will all be able to meet uh, physically in person uh, soon again. Um, especially, uh, I hope that you in Israel, uh, who I know are facing uh, a lot of restrictions and uh, problems uh, now, uh, I, I hope you will manage well and uh, that we will all uh, recover soon. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank also um, uh, people at Technion for inviting me to give this presentation in the ACRC uh, Semiconductor Webinars. It's a great pleasure uh, to do it. I appreciate that so many of you attend. Um, I really appreciate that you are spending your time and I hope you will find it worthwhile. So I, will, I guess I will start into the talk. Um, uh, the topic is active electronic transceivers for terahertz communication systems. And uh, the outline um, of the seminar is like this. So I will first uh, uh, give a very brief introduction to terahertz communication. I would then like to talk a little bit about link budget considerations. Um, and then dive into a more technical part, which uh, is going to be about frequency multiplication as a means to generate uh, a terahertz uh, signal. And uh, then I will show you uh, an example of an MMIC chipset, which is designed for 300 gigahertz wireless link. And finally, I would like to give you some outlook or perspective on our current work uh, here in Stuttgart, uh, the projects we are involved, which uh, more or less all of them um, 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 com try to combine photonic and electronic technologies in this area of terahertz communication. Um, I, I propose to, um, to stop uh, in between those chapters here um, and to uh, pause for, for questions. Um, I also have the chat window open. So um, I, that is how I propose to do it so that I will break in between chapters and then maybe we can answer first questions. And then of course, at the end of the talk, it's time for questions. Okay, I will start. Um, an introduction. Well, first of all, um, basically things, things tend to get worse when you increase operating frequencies uh, uh, with uh, whatever technology you try. So why do we enter high millimeter wave, sub millimeter wave, terahertz frequencies? Well, there are some bandwidth related arguments. Uh, first of all is the well-known Shannon uh, theorem, which uh, gives the channel capacity um, of an additive white Gaussian noise channel as a function of uh, signal to noise ratio and essentially bandwidth. So um, the high bandwidth makes for high data rates at relatively modest uh, modulation complexity, which is the main motivation to move towards high carrier frequencies for wireless communication. In radar, we have the basic uh, FMCW range uh, equation, which relates the uh, range resolution to bandwidth. And again, uh, radars uh, tend to go to higher frequencies in order to exploit higher, higher bandwidths in order to uh, obtain higher uh, range resolutions. There are also some wavelength related arguments. Um, well, there is a miniaturization of antennas. Systems tend to become smaller. Um, for instance, because the antennas tend to get smaller um, at higher frequencies. Uh, radiometrics resolutions are wavelengths related and therefore they increase with, um, with the smaller uh, wavelengths. 
Um, we have a lot of interesting applications in spectroscopy uh, where we have very different uh, molecule, molecules which have their absorption lines in these uh, frequency ranges. So that is another important application here. And it is interesting to, uh, to exploit in this uh, terahertz frequency range the different material properties in terms of reflectance, transmittance and absorption and many applications are targeting such aspects. Um, now, let's look at technology, semiconductor technologies. Um, um, I have tried to plot uh, a few uh, dots in terms of cutoff frequencies, FT, Fmax, as a function of feature size, um, the gate length for field effect transistors and MOSFETs, um, the uh, emitter width for bipolar transistor technologies, and uh, you can look at the free five technologies, gallium arsenide based, indium phosphide based, the silicon uh, technologies, NMOS and uh, silicon germanium HPTs. Um, there's also gallium nitride entering the picture and all of these transistor technologies, all of these actually are available with high enough cutoff frequencies in the millimeter wave and in the sub millimeter wave range to uh, implement active electronic circuits. Um, so we have a choice uh, in order to operate at these frequencies between three, five compound semiconductors and silicon based technologies. We also have a choice of exploiting the, the properties of uh, field effect transistors, uh, but also of bipolar transistors. So um, because all of these have cutoff frequencies, which are um, well into the sub millimeter wave range. Uh, we achieve record maximum frequencies of oscillations today, well beyond one terahertz. And Fmax uh, is most, the most relevant uh, cutoff frequencies for analog and millimeter wave uh, circuits. So the ones I will be focusing at uh, today. Mm, even if you look at FT, um, FT of aggressively scaled transistor technologies uh, today goes up to close to 700 gigahertz for 3.5 technologies, but even silicon, uh, CMOS and HPTs are achieving uh, 500 gigahertz and beyond FT and FT makes for fast digital and fast mixed signal uh, circuits. And that's why we see all those technologies addressing the, um, uh, these kind of frequencies. But there are more aspects to be considered uh, in terms of the choice of technology. Um, it's not as simple as just looking at the cutoff frequency. There are many, many more um, figures of merit need to be considered. An entity I like to look at is actually the MSG, MAG. So that's the maximum stable gain, maximum available gain as a function of frequency. And uh, at your target frequency of operation, it will decide on the gain per stage of an amplifier. And if this gain per stage is high, then you have as a circuit designer, more degrees of freedom um, to trade a gain versus bandwidth. Um, because remember the main motivation to go to these high frequencies is to exploit high bandwidth. Um, but you also need to, uh, your, 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 your circuits also need to deliver this bandwidth. And therefore, um, a high gain per stage is very beneficial. Eventually, it also uh, translates into a high efficiency. Although mostly this is not, in most applications today at least, this is not the main, um, the main um, figure. Breakdown voltage, very important. Um, you not only want to have high cutoff frequencies, you want to have actually the combination of high cutoff frequencies and breakdown voltage because if you want to implement something like a power amplifier, um, you are interested in, in having an, uh, a relatively high low pull impedance, uh, which will allow you to go for wide band output power and not just narrow band output power. And uh, building a wide band power amplifier at high uh, operating frequencies is a major challenge, of course. Um, passives, uh, the quality factor Q of passives is also a headache at uh, increasing frequencies. 
uh, um, low queues make for loss and low efficiency in your integrated circuits. Uh, all these were um, uh, figures where 3.5 uh, te technologies have, um, let's say, advantages, um, but there are many, many important features which make silicon almost exclusively the technology of choice also for such uh, applications at terahertz frequencies. Um, May, most, mostly because they will, uh, silicon based technologies will give you a high uniformity, extremely high yield, and matched transistors, as opposed to most of the hemp based 3 5 technologies. Therefore, the integration density is extremely high. And what is probably of most importance is that only silicon today can give you something like a system on chip uh, capability to combine digital, analog, and millimeter wave performance. Uh, today is exclusively uh, possible with silicon. Cost, of course, um, besides all the technical aspects, cost is, uh, is usually the deciding factor. And here it is a strange mixture actually, uh, while silicon will address um, large scale markets, uh, mass markets, um, three fives uh, find it easier to address niche markets um, and to implement circuits on the prototyping level. So all these uh, translate into a very complex picture in terms of the choice of technology. Um, here is, are some examples of chips which were designed and built in my team. And um, the important thing I want to point out here to now focus on terahertz communication. Actually, I think it's sort of like a gentleman agreement in the scientific community that people talk about terahertz uh, when actually we are not looking at one terahertz or higher, but at a roughly 0.1 terahertz, so actually 100 gigahertz, people typically uh, start to speak about terahertz electronics. And if it's an application focus on communication, um, people talk about terahertz communication, um, where we can achieve multi tens of gigabit per second data rate for wireless communication systems. Okay, there are, there's a, a large range of applications. It's easy to come up with many, many potential applications where, where a high bandwidth and a high data rate is required. Um, I like to put it in brackets that these are potential applications because today, of course, none of us probably has a terahertz communication system in his pocket or in his computer. Um, but um, these applications are emerging and prospective. Um, in terahertz communication, I always try to point out that you have to really um, distinguish between distances. So when we talk about centimeter distances, it's more like intra-machine, board-to-board communication, maybe data, fast data synchronization, which take place on a centimeter level. Uh, and here the technologies of, to of choice will be, of course, uh, silicon CMOS, um, maybe photonics, which are also, which have many um, advantages over electronics. Then when we go into the meter range of communication systems, we talk about things like home theaters, wireless LAN, wireless personal area networks, the media shower or the media kiosk, data centers, smart offices. Uh, here, I think today the technology of choice will be rather um, the more performing silicon germanium by CMOS technologies. And then if we go up in distances uh, towards front hauling, back hauling in uh, 5G, 6G mobile communication systems, in access networks, and finally in relatively high distance fixed point-to-point -point wireless links, then I think that the, the technology of choice is still uh, due to its uh, relatively high performance, the three fives, gallium marsnite, indium phosphide, and um, more recently also gallium nitride technologies. Okay, so much about an introduction. Um, I guess I will dive into the link budget considerations and then we, um, we, we have a break um, after that uh, chapter because it's all still introductory. Um, there are many basic dependencies on frequency, respectively wavelength, uh, 
uh, to be considered if you think about the link budget of such a communication system at terahertz frequencies. Uh, first of all, the free space path loss is going to be proportional to 1 over f squared. Um, however, this free space path loss is compensated for by the antenna gain, which is related to the antenna aperture. And the gain of the antenna is going to be proportional to the square of the frequency. And therefore, the first thing to observe is that the free space path loss is compensated by the antenna gain, typically in terahertz communication systems. However, for a given antenna aperture, what is also going to scale with frequency is the antenna directivity, which you can measure in terms of the half power beam width. Uh, it's going to be proportional to 1 over f, and therefore this compensation of free space path loss is going to come at the cost of antenna directivity. Um, if you can look at any um, extreme high frequency communication link, these are not isotropic antennas. These are directive, more or less directive antennas. It can even go up to the point where we talk about quasi-optical point-to-point -point links with an extremely small pencil beam. Um, that also means that except for a fixed wireless link, virtually all applications, if you think back to this picture of prospective applications of terahertz communication, they will require some form of electronic or photonic or maybe mechanical beam steering. We will not get away without beam steering if we want to make such systems um, operational in real life environments. Um, a big headache for circuit designers is the system gain uh, the, of a transceiver, of a transmit-receive combination. And the system gain is essentially the transmit power, the linear transmit power of a transmitter divided by the minimum required receive signal strength at the receiver. And in this entity is of course the receiver noise figure. The receiver noise figure is hidden in there. Um, and this system gain has to be maximized under the conditions of maintaining a high bandwidth and maintaining a high linearity of the transmit receive uh, chain. Now the problem is that if we look at the output power of solid state power amplifiers as a function of frequency, we see that this power is dropping with frequency. It gets more and more difficult to produce a high output power uh, as we increase frequencies. Uh, if we look at 300 gigahertz, we talk today at roughly 10 dBm on a single chip power amplifier. Of course, now you can go to the extent of paralyzing chips and so on, but this makes uh, the complexity very high. On a single chip at 300 gigahertz today, we uh, talk about maybe 10 to 13 dBm of output power. And also the technologies start to uh, get a little bit more rare. Um, um, what is very well usable in the area around 300 gigahertz are three fives. Also silicon technologies are moving up. Um, but in terms of the product of linearity and bandwidth, to my knowledge, the three fives still have an, um, an advantage here. In terms of output power, I think and, uh, at relatively moderate frequencies, it's important to uh, consider that gallium nitride as uh, white band gap semiconductor material uh, provides today's state of the art solid state output power, roughly up to 100 gigahertz. There are lab examples going beyond that, but you, you achieve at least one watt even two watts on a single chip solid state power amplifier in gallium nitride uh, technology today at around 100 gigahertz. On the receiver side, the picture is uh, the inverse. The LNA noise figure as a function of frequency will increase um, with frequency. And, and what it means is that your system gain actually decreases effectively as you go up in frequency. Okay, atmospheric attenuation. I think you probably are all more or less aware of this. Um, here is a plot uh, of atmospheric uh, attenuation on a kind of sea level um, in, given in dB per kilometer. Uh, 
we see the red curve, which looks nice. Where we find the uh, absorption lines of oxygen. Of course, the 60 gigahertz line is well known. Um, in our millimeter wave, submillimeter wave range, we have two dominant uh, water lines uh, here, but we also find atmospheric windows, at least under clear sky conditions. It's, all interesting, it's also interesting to know that we have recently seen a new IEEE uh, standard, IEEE 802.15.3D, which um, addresses the frequency range from 250 to 325 gigahertz, which is exactly, let's say, at the upper edge of one of these large atmospheric windows. The problem is when adverse weather hits us, um, the green curve shows the attenuation for he re heavy rain. And you can say that essentially all the way from the 60 gigahertz absorption line onwards, um, the rain will dominate the atmospheric gloss with about 20 dB per kilometer of attenuation. Uh, that is a huge uh, amount of attenuation. And so the weather conditions affect those limbs very significantly. And this is, uh, can be illustrated when you do a, a limb budget. This here is one which is calculated at a center frequency of 240 gigahertz. And uh, given some uh, basic entities like uh, the required uh, EB and NOT or signal to noise ratio, um, the, the, the exploited bandwidth, which of course should be very high because that is the purpose of terahertz communication, then some reasonable transmit power, some margin, some actual noise figure which we obtain in our um, transmit receive uh, chips, some antenna efficiency, and if you do the calculation, you can do this for uh, a sweeping uh, range of the link distance and then calculating the required antenna gain. And you can translate this into an antenna diameter of a parabolic antenna. And it is now obvious that as we are on a centimeter range, in order to maintain centimeter range links, we already need some antenna gain, let's say a few dBs of antenna gain. And these short range links are therefore possible with typical on-chip integrated antennas, which will give you a few dBs of antenna gain. Then as we go up in distance into the meter level, we require antenna gains uh, between, let's say, 10 to maybe 20, 25 dBi. And this is something which is already so uh, directive that even uh, links which go across a few meters will require some form of electronic beam steering or some form of beam steering. And as we go even up in, in, in distance, let's say up to 100 meters and beyond, maybe to one kilometer, then we see the impact of the atmospheric attenuation. Uh, this link budget is given for clear sky condition and for heavy rain. And we see that under heavy rain, as we go up in, in distance, um, the, the, the attenuation will be so high that you have to compensate it with even higher antenna gain. But remember the antenna gain translates into extremely high directivity. And it, at some point it becomes impractical um, to align the antennas. So that is a big challenge for terahertz communication and something which people often also neglect is the fact that as you go up in frequency, um, all your electronic circuits are going to worsen in terms of their performance. So thinking about frequency generation, implementing oscillators, implementing frequency multipliers um, is going to get worse at higher frequencies. Frequency translation in mixers, uh, amplification in low noise amplifiers and power amplifiers they will introduce various forms of distortion and these distortions get worse at higher frequencies. Um, we can think of the phase noise of oscillators which, decrease, uh, which increases with frequency. Um, if we use the concept of frequency multiplication, we will have to deal with unwanted harmonics and spurious tones in our local oscillator signal. Um, things like finite isolations um, are uh, impacting at high frequencies very much. 
And in quadrature mixers, since we want to exploit very wide bandwidths, the quadrature imbalance, um, gain and phase imbalances start to play an increasing role. And the bottom line is that our link budget, which was based on an additive wide Gaussian noise channel, is not correct anymore. Because essentially now, um, we are not just talking about the impairments in the air interface, but also uh, we have to uh, figure in the impairments of our transceiver radio. These impairments, uh, you can show what they essentially result in. The, probably the most famous uh, effect is phase noise, which will give you sort of a, a rotation of the constellation diagram of a complex modulated signal. Uh, Gaussian noise is going to widen up the point cloud around a perfect constellation point and the other impairments like gain imbalance, phase imbalance, compression and intermodulation distortion, all of them leads to a degradation of the error vector magnitude EDM um, and that gets worse as you increase the carrier frequencies and as you increase the bandwidth. Okay. This is why today we are working towards a specification-driven circuit design. Uh, I would say the state of the art in terahertz communication is still very much bottom up. So you take some technology, a fast one, you implement circuits, amplifiers, mixers, you build a transceiver, and then you carry out your transmission experiment. And basically you take what you get. Um, but I think in the next step, we uh, need to do what what uh, wireless communication has been doing for decades at uh, more moderate frequencies, we need to go uh, for a specific, uh, for specific specification driven application specific um, transceiver architecture and its design. But this is ongoing work. Okay, so much about these two chapters. So may I propose to have a look into the chat and to see if there are any questions or comments so far. So please use your right hand uh, blue icon so we will be able to, uh, to unmute you. If not, I will keep going. And um, in the, next, uh, in the next part, I would like to talk a little bit about the frequency multiplication as a means to generate signals to drive uh, transmit receive front end. So in this picture, um, this is a very generic um, picture of an analog front end, um, which consists of different building blocks. Of course, there are antennas involved, maybe even antennas arrays we may have an antenna distribution network consisting of a switch network, filters, um, maybe some phase shifters um, in phase arrays and so on. And then at, at the heart of such a transceiver is um, an up conversion stage with potentially some RF post amplification. And we have a receiver, um, a down converter stage with potentially some low noise pre amplification and those up and down converters need to be driven by a local oscillator signal here in some frequency generation part of your transceiver. And there are basically two approaches. One approach is to use a fundamental oscillator, some VCO, uh, implemented at the carrier frequency to drive directly um, a mixer. But as you go up in, in uh, carrier frequencies, um, it is more, it is typically more advantageous to go for a subharmonic frequency um, generation with uh, a low frequency oscillator. Um, and then to multiply the frequency up using a frequency multiplier stage. And uh, if you look at any, or if, if you look at the chipsets around today uh, at 100 gigahertz and beyond, um, to my knowledge, at least most uh, people, most designers are opting for the frequency multiplication approach because it is more advantageous, especially in terms of the 
face noise, uh, which I also think is uh, coming as a question in the chat line. So, so which architecture to use actually, I think depends on the, among others, on the face noise and the uh, um, achievable bandwidth. And um, doing a frequency multiplier typically um, produces a lower effective phase noise than implementing the VCO at the fundamental frequency. So when we want to go for the frequency multipliers, um, we have to consider several figures of merit. Um, of course, there is a multiplication factor and we would like we would like it to be high in order to be able to enter at a relatively low frequency. Um, such a frequency multiplier should produce a high output power, enough to drive an up or down converter mixer. But another important figure is the conversion gain or conversion loss, um, because we would like to also only drive such a multiplier with a finite amount of input power. Right? So the, uh, the relation between the output power at the wanted frequency and the input power at the subharmonic frequency, the conversion gain is an important figure of merit. Most important, or well, very important is the suppression of unwanted harmonics because this is never infinitely high. Uh, we will find at the output of our frequency multiplier all the unwanted harmonics, which are multiples of the input frequency and of course, it is obvious the higher the multiplication factor, the closer the spacing of the unwanted harmonics. And it is, um, it is an important goal for any circuit designer of a frequency multiplier to suppress these uh, unwanted harmonics while maintaining a high output power at the wanted harmonic. Phase noise is another important uh, issue. So we will have, we will inject a signal with some finite phase noise. And this phase noise is going to be degraded actually by a factor of 20 log n. So 20 times the logarithm of the multiplication factor. And it's going to be therefore much higher at the output of the frequency multiplier. One can also look at the a noise uh, matrix of such a frequency multiplier. Um, with a phase and an amplitude modulation uh, index here and an ideal frequency multiplier will only affect the phase noise and will degrade it by a 20 log n, but it will not affect the amplitude noise. That is an ideal amplify, um, frequency multiplier, that, but that is difficult to realize in um, real life. To give you one example of such a frequency multiplier, um, I'm showing here a multiplier by 12. It's actually a cascade of a doubler, a buffer amplifier, a tripler, some filter buffer amplifier, and then a doubler, and again, some filtering stage. Um, it is designed to produce output frequencies in W band. And this is using some, so it's, it's obvious an active transistor-based frequency multiplier. I don't want to go into detail about uh, those uh, entities here. What I want to point out is the phase noise degradation um, of 20 log n. And um, it is something that you have to verify when you build a frequency multiplier. And this measurement is shown here in this top graph. So you see a measurement of the phase noise. And um, what is shown is the comparison of the um, the input phase noise coming from a synthesizer, a lab uh, instrument, and which is then degraded by 20 log uh, 12. So that is the, the theoretical curve is the red curve and the actual measured curve at the output of the frequency multiplier by 12 is the blue curve. And what you see is that it's nice, it's nice on top of each other. There is no deviation between the theoretical phase noise degradation and the actual measured phase noise. And therefore this frequency multiplier by 12 is a good frequency multiplier, especially if you also have a look at the suppression of the unwanted harmonics. So the actual 12th harmonic is nice, flat and wide band, 
and all the other harmonics are suppressed in this typical bathtub curve. And we have here a suppression of about 30 or so ish uh, dBc um, with respect to the 12th harmonic. Um, to sum that up, um, here I'm showing a few examples of MMIC based multiplier, frequency multipliers we have implemented over the past years. Um, we have implemented many different multiplication factors, multipliers by eight, by 12, and all of them typically originate at the input in X band at around 10 gigahertz. So your VCO will operate in X band and then we take the signal from there, we multiply it up into um, somewhere in the W band around 100 gigahertz. And from there we take it and multiply it by two in order to achieve 200 gigahertz. Um, we multiply by three in order to go towards 300 gigahertz. We can multiply by four to go towards 400 gigahertz. And it is even possible to multiply by six to address a frequency range at 600 gigahertz. And this is typically how we generate our signals, a typical architecture of our chipsets to address um, terahertz communication looks like this. If we want to implement an, a, a transmit receive system operating at 300 gigahertz, we will actually generate a signal in X band at 8.33 gigahertz using some PLL, VCO, maybe some lab synthesizer. And then comes the first MMIC, which is this multiplier by 12, um, generating an, an W band signal at 100 gigahertz. And then we go into the next chip, which is a transmitter or a receiver. And this will integrate another frequency multiplier by three in this, in this case here, so that the mixer and the amplifier stages operate at 300 gigahertz. Okay, that was about frequency multipliers, maybe a little quick, but um, need to watch time. So there was one question on the chat line. What is the model versus lab measurement correlation at these terahertz frequencies? Yes, yes. Ah. The model versus the lab measurement correlation. Good question. Um, well, it is not very good. Um, the higher the frequency, the worse the correlation between model and measurement. But it is not as easy as that. You have to distinguish. At some point, you also have to uh, 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 admit that the measurement itself is going to get a larger and larger error bar as you go up in frequency. So um, the measurement goes worse, but also the correlation between model and measurement. Next thing you have to distinguish is small signal model and large signal model. If I want to build a small signal amplifier, I can use a small signal transistor model. And this is relatively easily done, I would say. And you get a very good correlation between model and lab measurement. However, looking at a complete transceiver or a transmitter receiver, which has many frequency converting stages. This requires a nonlinear model. And the nonlinear modeling um, at terahertz frequencies is, is a huge challenge. And that is, at least in my experience, what creates a rather large deviation between simulated performance and measured performance. It comes down to the nonlinear elements. All the linear effects, also the passives, the substrates, and so on, they can be well modeled uh, using electromagnetic co simulation, which is mandatory. But the nonlinear elements, the transistors, the diodes, um, these, um, uh, for this, you need a, a challenging, accurate large signal model. Okay, um, address nonlinear based versus injection oscillator based multiplication. 
Um, okay, I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. Um, injection oscillator based multiplication. I mean, you can you can build an oscillator and stabilize it in terms of its frequency characteristics by injection locking. I'm not sure what you mean with multiplication here. Um, so I propose to put this question maybe further to the end. Otherwise, I will probably not give a satisfactory answer. Um, noise figure. The next question is about how do we not measure noise figure at terahertz ranges? Looking at the noise flow is a bit ambiguous and we don't have a noise source at terahertz. Yes. Um, noise figure measurements are very, very tricky. You, um, we, we, use, um, we use two uh, methods. Either you have actually a noise source, but these noise sources are getting, um, uh, have a poor, poor performance as you go up in frequency. Um, the, way, um, the way we now, um, let's say, estimate the noise figure of our receivers is by, um, by using the, um, essentially the hot, you have the hot cold method, so you can, you can, um, um, you can use, uh, try to try to measure uh, thermal noise. Um, and, uh, and apart from that, basically we try to measure this, the directly the degradation of the signal to noise ratio um, from the input to the output um, through the through measuring a, a complete receiver, so actually measuring noise figure is extremely challenging at these high frequencies, and that is why only very few groups and very few people actually measure it. Um, most people will simply simulate it and rely on their noise model, which I think is not very satisfactory because. Um, whether noise models are accurate at such frequencies, I would doubt it very much. Um, models for phase noise, for oscillators at terahertz frequency, well, that is a difficult question. I think there is a lot of work being done uh, to try and model phase noise uh, at terahertz frequencies, but I cannot give you a satisfactory answer here. Uh, Naftali, uh, Ingmar, we have another question. Uh, it comes from uh, Naftali. Naftali, you are unmuted now, so you can ask. Uh, yes, thank you. So is the preferred approach for frequency multiplication in your designs is uh, using just a non-linearity, which ah. is then amplified, or using injection-locked oscillators, which are locked by subharmonic injection signal. Okay, now I understand uh, the question. I think this relates to the one uh, earlier on. Um, so in my group, we are exclusively using nonlinearity based frequency multipliers. Um, um, but that doesn't mean that we have done an extensive investigation uh, of comparing it to the injection locking principle of an oscillator. It is just my, let's say, my, my feeling or my bet, my guess, that um, um, maybe what you, what, you, what you should consider when you do an injection-locked oscillator, um, then um, I doubt that you will get a very wide band operation. Um, for, however, when you use nonlinearity based frequency multipliers, you can get extreme bandwidth. Of course, at the cost of um, suppression of unwanted harmonics, so you cannot arbitrarily increase the bandwidth um, because the unwanted harmonics are going to pop up stronger. But in principle, with a nonlinearity based frequency multiplier, in principle, you can obtain extremely large bandwidth. Whereas in my 
opinion, but I might be wrong. I, I don't think that you will get something like a similar bandwidth operation when you go for injection locked uh, uh, oscillators. The phase noise may be comparable, maybe even advantageous, but I doubt that you will obtain the same amount of bandwidth. That would be my answer. Um, but it is an interesting question and I don't think there is a finite, uh, a definite, uh, a definite, uh, um, uh, you know, point. A lot of it depends on technology, but in principle, my, my, my preferred option is uh, to go for nonlinear frequency multipliers. Um, okay, interconnect chip to antenna was a question. Yes, yes. Um, it's going to be in my outlook conclusion that this is the this is where things are uh, really critical uh, today. Um, of course, we try to put most functionalities on the chip in order to avoid the interconnects. Uh, we try to put antennas on the chip, but uh, an on-chip antenna will limit the performance in terms of bandwidth. It will have a relatively poor efficiency, so you may want to have an interconnection between a chip and a standalone antenna. And how to do those interconnects? Um, well, in, in the systems we are using, we use um, actually waveguide technology, and we use um, interconnection substrates like quartz substrates, but um, in a, using a waveguide um, module, as you will see later on in those examples, um, is for many applications completely prohibitive. Um, a waveguide module cannot be accepted in, in, in most applications due to size, weight, cost. It's extremely costly. Um, so you need to do something else than a metallic waveguide. Um, and, and then, um, well, no method is, is as good today as a waveguide, so you will have higher losses, you will reduce bandwidth, um, but, other, but there are many very good substrates which you can use, uh, which operate at least into the sub-millimeter wave range. Okay. Uh, maybe we can we can we can we can go on, and then uh, at the end we will be able to uh, answer. Go on a little exactly. I will just read this question since the data on EM waveguide. What is the waveguide material future for photonic design approaches and sources? Yes. So I would say this last question maybe we discuss at the end. Uh, um, you will see that in our in our links we still, if you like, work with um, um, waveguides, magnetic waveguides. Um, metallic waveguides, and of course, I, I understand that one has to go away from it. So let me show you a few examples here. Um, we have developed front ends operating in E-band, so that I would not call uh, terahertz communication. That is the uh, well-known um, uh, frequency ranges for point-to-point for -point links, terrestrial links at 70 to 80 gigahertz. And then we uh, started our work in uh, G-band, so around 240 gigahertz. I like this frequency because not only there is an ISM band at 240 gigahertz, but it is really right in the center of this atmospheric window. Um, however, our latest work is all centered around 300 gigahertz. Um, this is basically also the limit where the frequency allocation um, uh, is ending today and where we really enter sub-millimeter wave uh, frequencies so um, most of our work today focuses on 300 gigahertz links. To give you some examples of transmission experiments which were conducted in the past in my team, um, this graph shows a transmission distance um, versus a data rate in gigabit per second for these three different frequency ranges. And uh, what is shown is uh, the constellation diagrams of different modulation schemes we transmit. We always have quadrature um, transmitters, quadrature receivers, which allow us to use um, quadrature uh, complex modulation. Um, something like the, the, the first thing one does is, of course, to go for QPSK, which is a very robust 
um, modulation format, which does not require a very high uh, signal to noise ratio to be detected. And uh, one experiment we did already many years ago was to work at 240 gigahertz over a distance of 850 meters. And we were able to transmit 32 gigabaud QPSK that translates into 64 gigabit per second using extremely highly directive antennas. If you look at the antenna gain, two times 55 EBI is an extremely high antenna gain and therefore it is a highly directive pencil beam quasi optical. Um, then um, we can uh, have a look at uh, one experiment which uh, links to the last um, um, chapter today is the combination of a photonic uh, transmitter and an electronic receiver. This was actually achieving 100 gigabit per second with uh, 20 gigabaud 16 QAM modulation. So that translates into 100 gigabit per second. Um, the transmit power from the optical transmitter was very low or relatively low uh, with minus 13 dBm. And again, we were using relatively high gain antennas to transmit over a distance of 20 meter. And you see, it always comes down to the point that you have a finite system gain. We have some transmit power available. We have some noise figure in the receiver. And this dictates um, basically the amount of antenna gain we need to bridge a certain distance. And uh, the higher the antenna gain, the higher the directivity of the link. And that therefore many, many of the application scenarios, which I mentioned earlier on drop out. Uh, okay. Um, an example is a 300 gigahertz transmit receive MMIC chipset. Um, the architecture is shown here. We will, the, the local oscillator generation takes place in the frequency multiplier by 12, uh, which I've discussed already. So we inject the signal in X band. We have a transition from one component to the other, from chip to chip, if you like, at 100 gigahertz. But then the transmit MMIC and the receive MMIC, which are separate, they actually deal with the frequency multiplication by three um, with a, with a multiplicative nonlinear uh, frequency multiplier, which multiplies to 300 gigahertz. And then we have a fundamental uh, mixer uh, with quadrature input on the transmitter side, quadrature output on the receiver side, and we integrate an RF post and pre amplification. Um, this is, if you have a closer look at such a circuit, how it is built, you can recognize here a um, mixer cell. We like to use passive resistive fed mixers, which are bidirectional, which are of course lossy. But the nice thing about them is they are relatively linear, linear and they are very wide band. And then in order to obtain a high local oscillator to RF isolation, we will use balanced concepts. So here we are balancing two resistive mixer cells with two times 90 degree couplers to make it a balanced mixer. And then you take two of these mixer cells and combine it with a 90 degree coupler to obtain quadrature operation. Okay. Then in front here is a frequency multiplier by three. We like in, when we implement frequency multipliers by three, we typically go for a compressed class A trans, uh, transistor. There are other options, but uh, we prefer this one. Um, we then can post amplify uh, with a, in order to deliver the amount of LO power, um, which is quite significant because in the end it is split again in this splitting network. So before it reaches the individual trans, uh, resistive mixer cell, um, a lot of it is lost in the splitter network. And then we post amplify to obtain a certain RF transmit power. The receiver looks essentially identical all the way from the tripler to the resistive mixer. It is identical. The resistive mixer is bi-directional. It can also be used as a receive mixer. 
uh, just we need to exchange the power amplifier by a low noise pre-amplifier. Um, here are the cheap photographs. Um, sorry, the image quality is bad. Um, I'm sorry for this. This happened when I reduced the file size. Um, these chips are built in a 3.5 compound semiconductor technology, uh, which is developed by the Fraunhofer Society in Germany. Um, we are talking about the 35 nanometer gate length metamorphic high electron mobility transistor. Um, it's based on gallium arsenide substrates and building an INDAS channel device, which resembles an indium phosphide uh, kind of device on top of the gallium arsenide substrate, makes it a metamorphic hemp, and it has cutoff frequencies of F, F max beyond one terahertz. So the chips are about one by three square millimeter in size. They compare to a silicon chip, they are quite large. The integration density is very low because you see the amount of transistors is very low. The functionality which is integrated is compared to a silicon, to a modern silicon chip is very low, I admit. However, we stick to this technology because it gives you a very good uh, wide, wide operating frequency range, very good gain per stage, very low noise, and a decent output power. Uh, to give you an idea, maybe I will not talk about the technology too much, uh, to give you an idea about the performance you can obtain with such uh, chipsets is uh, in the transmitter. Um, we achieve, without any IF amplification, we achieve a 6 dB linear conversion gain, a saturated output power of around 3 dBm. So at 300 gigahertz, we talk about one to two milliwatts of transmit signal power. Um, if you uh, go to 1 dB compression, which you need to do if you want to transmit also different amplitude states in the modulated signal, then the transmit power reduces to about minus 1 dBm. The bandwidth is actually uh, not as large as I would like, but it is very decent. We have about 40 gigahertz of uh, 3 dB RF bandwidth in the transmitter. And we need to drive this with about 6 dBm at 100 um, gigahertz input power, which we can easily obtain from the frequency multiplier by 12. In the receiver, we get a linear conversion gain of about 11 dB. There is no IF amplification involved in this uh, chip. So it only comes from the low noise amplifier gain and a standalone low noise amplifier was measured to have a noise figure of roughly 7 dB. To my knowledge, this is state of the art performance. 7 dB of a noise figure at 300 gigahertz is something which you cannot achieve with a silicon based technology. That doesn't mean that you cannot use silicon, uh, but it just means that with silicon, your system gain um, reduces even more than when you use 3.5, you can keep the system gain. So the difference between transmit power and noise, receiver noise, you can keep it relatively high while maintaining a wide bandwidth. So the, the receive bandwidth here um, is also roughly around 40 gigahertz bandwidth. So this is what we, what you can achieve. Um, these chips um, which were used uh, in a system which was actually built as a four channel phased array transmit receive from them. So here you find again this receive and transmit chip and it is part of this phased array at this point here. Then we have the frequency multipliers by 12 and the phased array is formed by local oscillator beam steering using a, a DDS, a direct digital synthesis based um, four channel synthesizer operating at 8.33 gigahertz, um, um, giving a coherent four channels output. This is something which is, uh, let's say, state of the art with uh, direct digital synthesis uh, chips, you can do this. And then we come with four channels of our up converter. And then there is a special 
metallic waveguide module, which is put in front, which combines the four outputs here and brings it into a phased array where the, where the distances between individual antenna elements correspond to roughly one lambda, because at 300 gigahertz, the free space wavelength is of course one millimeter. The photograph of this is shown here. You can maybe distinguish at this point here the four antenna um, outputs, which are spaced by one millimeter. And then there are four channels of the transmit and receive modules. And here you see the kind of packaging technology which is used. It's metallic waveguides, bulky, heavy, but very high performance. The DDS based syn uh, frequency synthesis is down here. And uh, with such a system, we were able to do uh, at least a basic form of electronic beam steering. So you, we were able to, beam the, to steer the beam here in around 40 degrees. But uh, since the spacing of uh, individual channels is not very uh, small, um, you get relatively important side lobes, which is um, you know, that, that is simply down to the fact that we were not able to space these antenna elements closer due to the fabrication tolerances of such a metallic waveguide. Okay, that was an example about a 300 gigahertz MMIC based uh, wireless link. Um, all electronic MMICs and uh, the last uh, part here of this talk uh, would be about combining photonic and electronic uh, technologies, which is what we do in our recent projects. Um, mix, uh, I have a question on the chat line about mixer noise. If your passive mixer will have higher noise than the LNA and thus does the gain of the LNA compensate enough to say the overall noise figures around 6.7 dB? Yes, um, the LNA has a gain of about um, 30 dB, uh, between 25 and 30 dB. The mixer stage has a loss of roughly 13 to 15 dB. So therefore the mixer noise figure is in that ballpark. It's around 15 dB. The standalone LNA has a noise figure of about 7 dB and it has a gain of about 30 dB. So if you do the calculation with the freeze formula of cascaded stages, actually the LNA will decide essentially on the overall receiver noise figure, simply because it has such a high gain. Okay, now I, I propose to to try and just give you a brief insight into what we do uh, with combining photonic and electronic technologies. And then we are, we are done. I think I'm also running over time, but uh, so I'll try to be quick. So what we do in current projects is we work at 300 gigahertz and we um, use, we combine the photonic components, not of our uh, group, uh, we work with partners here as well, um, in this case, a French group in Lille, which uh, develops a UTC-based, so uni-traveling carrier-based photodiodes. Um, uh, and they can use photonic mixing of two laser lines to generate a beat frequency, which then lies at 300 gigahertz. So they come from the small wavelengths, go down with photonic mixing to 300 gigahertz. We go up with our frequency multiplication to 300 gigahertz with our high-speed transistor technologies, and there we try to build links. So the first example is, a, is an ongoing project. It's called TOR. Um, it's, a, it's a European project with Japanese collaboration, and uh, we even have a company from uh, Israel here, Siklu, um, which is a partner here. The goal in this project is to combine photonic and electronic technologies to build a 300 gigahertz link, which is compliant with this new IEEE standard 802.15.3D. And um, so we will have a 300 gigahertz transmitter, a 300 gigahertz receiver. Uh, we plan to address uh, front and uh, backhaul links of uh, mobile communication networks. 
And the special thing here is that we plan to combine it with actual real-time um, signal processing capabilities using commercial modems, which operate both at uh, 60 gigahertz and E-band. So this is an ongoing work. Um, initial results um, have been quite, um, quite um, promising because uh, we have demonstrated that this concept of super heterodyning, which is something not so conventional at terahertz communication, um, works nicely. So we have done a link uh, in a lab setup, which uh, transmit the signal um, at 300 gigahertz, but we are effectively transmitting a signal which was first modulated up at, a, at an IF frequency of around 10 gigahertz using um, a first up conversion stage and mixers before we address this IF modulated signal to the input of our 300 gigahertz transmitter. And then we down convert again to an IF frequency of 10 gigahertz in a first down conversion stage before we then down convert uh, into the baseband and analyze the signal. And this worked very well. Um, this is a complex slide and due to time, I will not dive into the details. Um, we, were, we transmitted up to 60 gigabit per second with 64 QAM modulation. Um, and we also were able to demonstrate this channel aggregation of um, aggregating several channels in frequency domain. So essentially a frequency division multiplexing approach um, you can see this in the spectrum here. There are two channels, each of them containing a 32 QAM modulated signal. Each channel has an 8 gigabit per second uh, data rate. Both of them are aggregated in the frequency domain at, at around 10 gigahertz, up converted to 300 gigahertz, down converted again to 10 gigahertz, down converted to baseband and um, it could be demodulated with a decent, uh, with a decent received quality. Um, and the second project, which is currently ongoing, is a French-German collaboration between my team and the EAMN in Lille in France, um, where we are using a photonic uh, transmitter, which uses laser mixing of two laser lines to generate a beat frequency at 300 gigahertz using this nonlinear photodiode. Um, and um, one of the two laser lines is modulated with some signal and we can then transmit this through the air and the receiver is again our electronic receiver, which I have already shown, consisting of an up converse, uh, an, a uh, multiplier to go to 300 gigahertz and then an electronic down converter with an LNA. And using this approach, um, the special thing of this setup um, was actually the extreme bandwidth we were able to generate. So it's worthwhile, I think, to look at those colored graphs. Um, maybe if they are not so easy to understand, the green curve is actually the normalized complex transmit transmission function. Um, so the transmission function of a system which consists only of a photonic transmitter and a an passive diode-based receiver. And you see how in using such a system, you have maybe a, a 6 dB cutoff frequency, or here what is shown is actually the 3 dB cutoff frequency of around 8 gigahertz. That means that if you use these components to build the link, you, have, you can modulate your signal roughly within a bandwidth of 8 gigahertz. When we go for our electronic system, um, this is the, um, the red curve and the pink curve. We obtain a 3 dB cutoff frequency of about 11-ish or 10-ish gigahertz, slightly higher than the passive link. But the very high transmission bandwidth came from combining the photonic transmitter with the active receiver. It's these dotted lines here, the blue one, and the turquoise line. And we were able to use a modulation bandwidth of 16 gigahertz. And within this modulation bandwidth, 
we were able to transmit an 80 gigabit per second QPSK signal, 40 gigabit symbol rate, um, with uh, noisy, of course, this is Gaussian noise limited here, but with a noisy constellation diagram, but we were able to down convert and demodulate. And uh, here are some examples of even higher modulation formats. It was also possible to demodulate a 16 QAM signal with 25 gigabit, so that is 100 gigabit per second. You can see how the this constellation diagram is really noisy, but um, you also have to take into account that the, the, the black dots, the black constellation diagram is what you get from your source and your sync. So from the arbitrary waveform generator at the source and the oscilloscope at the sync, um, this is already relatively noisy. And then if you go through the link, you add up with the red uh, point clouds, but it was still possible to demodulate the signal at 100 gigabit per second. Okay, that brings me to the end. Uh, very quickly, conclusions and outlook. So I still believe that 300 gigahertz directional links are a viable and a scalable options for gigabit uh, wireless uh, data rates in real world communication systems. So going outside of the lab into a real world application. Um, we have demonstrated in the lab 100 gigabit per second and I believe that it's going to work also in real life systems with relatively low complexity modulation formats only two to three bit per second per hertz uh, achieve such kind of data rates. And in my opinion, the future developments should focus on still, there is a lot of performance improvements which can be obtained in the analog transmit receive from them. Um, I think a lot of work needs to be spent still on electronic beam steering uh, for mobile or nomadic applications. And I think that silicon technologies and that photonic to technologies will be uh, the, the, the technologies of choice um, to go for phased arrays and so on. Um, a bottleneck turns out to be the energy efficiency of real-time digital signal processing at 100 gigabit per second and beyond. We always, or I always focus on the analog front end performance, but um, the power consumption of the digital um, baseband at 100 gigabit per second is enormous. And if people talk about all those nice and shiny application scenarios of terahertz communication, they always neglect the power consumption. And no battery driven system today will be able to sustain 100 gigabit per second data rate simply because the digital signal processing is far too power hungry. So we need to work on this. And finally, what we are currently doing in the frame of this tour project uh, is seamless network integration of the terahertz link into an actual uh, data network. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. And uh, now I don't know how much time is left, but for me, it's still fine to answer questions and to enter into discussions. Okay, thank you, Ingmar, very much. And please, uh, if somebody wants to ask something, use the right hand. You have the blue icon in the uh, in, in your Zoom uh, menu and we'll be able to unmute you. There is a question about metamaterial lenses. Yes, um, uh, I'm, you are probably more familiar than I with this. Um, metamaterials, yes, um, but to my knowledge, from what I have seen, the performance is not yet I mean, for some applications, it might be sufficient, but the, the losses, the efficiencies are very, the losses are high, the efficiencies are low, um, but I think it is a very promising way to go ahead, yes. Anything which, anything which allows us to go away from the bulky metallic waveguide is welcome. Um, um, dielectric uh, waveguides, metamaterials you know is all fine but i haven't seen anything which uh, matches the performance of the metallic waveguide yet for many applications that will be fine if you go for small distances
low transmission distances, I think you can live with a lot of loss. You can live with a very little efficiency of antennas. Um, you have to maintain bandwidth, which is another challenge, but the efficiency is not so, so important on, on low distances. But if you, as we do in my team, if you target high range communication links, um, nothing can match the metallic waveguide today. Are there any other comments or questions? Why don't you use on-ship antennas? Yes, yes, well, we do, we do. Um, just I uh, cannot show you the results yet. Um, but yes, at 300 gigahertz, um, using, as we do, gallium arsenide as a substrate material, you can build very, very decent um, on-chip antennas. However, however, I have to say that the, ant the on-chip antenna will, will always limit your performance. Um, either you build it as a wideband antenna because you don't want to limit the bandwidth, but you will lose efficiency or you try to build a high efficiency on-chip antenna, but then you will be restrained. Uh, you will, uh, the antenna, I think, is going to be the bottleneck for bandwidth. At least in the 3.5 technologies I was talking about. The amplifier stages obtain a nice bandwidth, and if you want to build a high efficiency antenna, the antenna bandwidth is going to be smaller than the bandwidth of the transmit receive from them. Is scaling a concern when you use on-chip antenna? Well, um, yes, scaling is always a concern and um, increasing losses are a concern, but, um, and then it depends how much aperture you want to obtain, how many wavelengths your antenna should contain. But um, um, we now, in order to go away from the waveguide packaging, we. And in order to avoid a chip-to-chip -chip transition at 300 gigahertz, the only way to go is to have an on-chip antenna and to radiate your 300 gigahertz signal off the chip directly. Okay, I hope I, hope I answered that question a little at least. So yes, we are working towards on-chip on antennas. Um, However, if you want to go to silicon, um, this is even a, an even much higher headache uh, because of course you cannot use the lossy silicon substrate unless you use some high resistivity thing or some local thinning or whatever. But um, um, so using on-chip antennas in 3.5, I think is no, well, no big deal. Um, don't quote me on that, but um, um, it is a very big deal in silicon technology. How important would it be to use gallium nitride, gallium arsenide based front end models in 5G cell phones versus silicon based? Oof. In a cell phone, so in an end user device. Uh, uh, wow. I, I'm, 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 of course, my heart lies with 3.5 technologies, and I would love to see 3.5 chipsets in 5G cell phones. Um, can you think of a trade-off that would make this choice compelling? Well, to be honest, I cannot think of a trade-off. I don't, I don't think we will find uh, 3.5 technologies in, um, in a 5G handset. Uh, personally, I think there is no trade-off uh, which would, man, which would, um, which would um, um, tolerate the, uh, the amount of the cost which is involved uh, simply for those uh, chipsets. The trade-off would be if there is a, if, if there is a, if there is a tremendous um, um, lower cost for those 3.5 technologies, but I don't see that happening. 
as the LNA is the first stage, and as you said that it will play a major role in determining the overall SNR. In such cases, the oscillator phase noise, phase noise will not play much role, is it? Yes, well, good question. And um, what, is, what is the limiting uh, um, effect? Uh, it is, of course, all a question of frequency, but if we stick to 300 gigahertz, you would expect that the phase noise is the limiting factor. Um, maybe you oscillate the phase noise, and actually what we see is that it's not the phase noise which is the limiting factor, it is actually the Gaussian noise uh, in our case. And, and you know why? The, the, the answer is relatively simple. Um, at least it is my answer to this. What, so the observation is that the oscillator phase noise is not the limiting factor, but rather the LNA noise figure. Um, and the answer is because we are using extremely wideband modulated signals. Um, the wider the modulation bandwidth, the lower the impact of I 1 over F phase noise of the oscillator. If you go for a very narrow band modulated signal, then the oscillator phase noise is the limiting, um, the limiting factor. But as you widen your, um, your signal um, spectrum, the, um, the 1 over F phase noise um, is not the dominant, the dominant uh, impact which limits the um, received signal quality anymore. However, the wider the bandwidth, what enters into the picture and what actually becomes dominant in our links is the quadrature imbalance. The quadrature imbalance can be corrected relatively easily in the digital domain as long as you have a relatively narrow band signal. Um, but in our signals, which are extremely wide band modulated, wide band modulated signals, the quadrature imbalance is frequency dependent. And it becomes much more challenging to correct for the quadrature imbalance. So I think the bottom line is it depends on the modulation bandwidth of your signal, whether the phase noise is your major concern or whether the Gaussian noise or whether the quadrature imbalance and other effects are the limiting factor. That is my opinion, but I am of course open to other opinions. Right? In our link, what we see is that the Gaussian noise is the limiting factor and uh, not so much the one over F noise. But that is only because we have very wide band modulation. Any other questions? If there are no, no more questions, and Ingmar, thank you very much. And uh, we really hope to have you again, but uh, this time at the Technion. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, again, thank you for the invitation. And uh, it is always a, a great pleasure to, um, to, to, to meet you, to work with you. Um, I appreciate that very much. And I'm really hoping that we will be able to, to physically meet um, all of us soon again. And again, all the best, especially to you in Israel. I'm sure you will manage well, but I, I also understand that it's really difficult at this uh, moment. So all the best to you and thank you uh, for listening. I really appreciate uh, that you spent your time. Thanks. Thank you.